today's video does contain some graphic and disturbing content, and as always, viewer discretion is advised. And, also, if you have a story you would like to send my way, just go to asthereavendreams.com and click the button to do so. And of course, merci. This was something that my dad and I witnessed many, many years ago. I was a kid, so some of the more business-related details are provided thanks to my dad. My dad used to partially own a lawn and landscaping company with a friend of his. They went in on it 50-50. I knew a lot of people that worked there because I often went with my dad and hung out in the back office or I would go there with my mom to drop off lunch for my dad. My mom was a 911 dispatcher, and often worked odd and long hours, so instead of leaving me home, my dad usually took me to work with him, and let me hang out in his office. He had a TV in there, and he had bought a VCR so that I could watch movies, and then I had a small chest in there with random toys and craft stuff to keep me occupied. However, as I got older, I became more curious about what he did, and I started following him around as he worked. Sometimes I even helped him when he was in the shop. He didn't let me go to customers' homes, though, because they can use some pretty dangerous equipment and even some harsh chemicals, so he felt that it wasn't safe. But the shop could have its own danger lurking. I was at least smart enough to avoid things and to not touch anything that I wasn't given explicit permission to. Yet, even with all those precautions, some of the adults were a little more careless. There was a guy named Mickey that was a little newer to the company. I was young, but I think my dad said that he had been working there for around six to eight months. He was also a younger guy compared to my dad, and some of the other people that worked there. I don't know if it's related or not, but he was also a bit more carefree. He never seemed to devote his attention to one project that he may be working on. He may have been watching TV that was in the shop, he may have been shouting to someone else, like they were talking or joking around, not out of anger, and this stuff had also gotten the attention of my dad and others, calling out to Mickey to pay attention, and to be more careful. He, again, would always brush it off like he wasn't doing anything wrong. However, there was one time that I was up there when my dad seemed upset as he talked to somebody else. I learned that this was because Mickey was supposed to be working, but hadn't arrived yet. He was late. About an hour or so after this, he finally walked in the door and... I remember him looking a little rough. They all had matching shirts, and some had vests, and then they wore whatever pants or shorts they wanted. He didn't have on either the shirt nor the vest, and when he came over to greet us and give me a high five, I could smell something sour, what I would later learn to be alcohol. He was drunk, or at least still reeked of the previous night's activities. Now, as mentioned, I didn't really know what that meant at the time. I was about 10 or 11 at this point, and my parents were far from alcoholics. My mom didn't drink, and my dad would occasionally have a beer when he had some friends over, but it was literally one or two, and he never acted differently. If I was older and understood more of what was going on, and the risk that it was, I definitely would have said something. Anyways, he seemed to try to avoid my dad being the boss on duty that day and just tried to immediately get back to work. This was also a Tuesday, and for some reason, it was their least busy or job demanding days, so there were a lot more people in the shop side of things. This is where they might schedule jobs, fix equipment and tools for customers, or even the stuff for the business. So Mickey had grabbed one of the store mowers because either the blades needed to be sharpened or repaired, or they could have even been stuck. 
so he was working on that. I remember walking over towards him at one point to see what he was doing, and he did tell me that I shouldn't be too close, because he was working with some pretty sharp parts. I started asking him a few questions and what he was doing, so he began answering them. I think causing him to forget about telling me to walk away. That was about the time that my dad walked over to tell me the same thing, while also getting on to Mickey about being late and then being drunk after he noticed the smell. My dad seemed pretty upset, and told him that after he finished what he was doing on that mower, he wanted him to go home. He tried to assure my dad that he wasn't drunk and that he would be okay, but my dad would not hear it. After that, I walked away to kill time, doing something else. It couldn't have been too long after this that I decided to go back into the office to play a game on my dad's computer. The office was right next to the entrance to the back area, where they do a lot of testing on mowers or weed whackers. I saw Mickey had pushed the mower out there and was using it. I remember hearing it, seeing him adjust his hat, and then I walked into the office. The door was still open so I could hear when the mower was turned off, and not maybe a minute or two later, I then heard a blood-curdling scream. It made me jump up and run out of the office, worried that something bad had just happened. I followed the screams to the back and saw Mickey holding one hand with another, and it was covered in blood. He was just screaming, and from what I could tell and piece together from what he was saying, the blades had cut his fingers off. I stood there frozen in fear and watched as other people ran past me trying to help him. What was even more terrifying to see and think about was that there were people walking around, looking in the grass, for his fingers. I was then yelled at to go into the office and not leave, which is where I stayed until my grandma came to get me. I heard that scream for months in my head. In my dreams, or more so nightmares, all I could see was the terror in Mickey's eyes and the bloody stumps on his hands. It took me a while to get past that, but even to this day, I still get queasy thinking about blood like that. Now, obviously, Mickey lived. He lost three fingers and part of his pinky. They were able to save two of them and even reattach the nerves or whatever so that they were usable but the strength isn't 100% back. The last one was too mangled to be saved. I got to see him when he came back into the shop a month or so later. The scars at least looked pretty cool, and he stayed optimistic about it, at least towards me joking how it looked like he was pieced back together with other parts. My dad later explained to me that the mower he was working on was pretty old, and it didn't have a working safety thing on it, so when he thought it was actually off, there was still a kill switch thing he had to flip before you did anything with the blades. He apparently did not toggle that switch, and when he went back down to check them out, because they had stopped moving or something, it all kicked on. And, well, you know the rest. He said it was a pretty big eye-opener for a lot of things for them, they replaced any outdated mowers so that they all used the same ones with all the new bells and whistles. They went through a lot more safety measures to prevent other accidents, and to this day, that was still the worst event they've ever had. I always knew that my dad worked with some pretty sharp and dangerous things, but that event really drove it home for me. And now, even as an adult with my own kids, I don't even like them being in the yard when I'm mowing. You just can't ever be too careful. I have always been an avid gardener, or at least I think that's the word for it. I'm not one that actually does things like fruits or vegetables, but I've always had a green thumb when it comes to flowers and bushes, and such. I've always found joy and peace in cultivating plants and spending time outside during the early days of spring. 
When I lived in the apartment complex that I lived at, my mother was actually a property manager for the location, and I worked with them to create a flower bed for the main office. I used my own money and took two weeks to actually get everything built and planted, and in the end, the landscaping could only be described as award-winning. Yes, I'm talking myself up, but also it was that damn good. When I bought my first home, I couldn't wait to personalize my front yard and create this beautiful and welcoming atmosphere for everyone who passed by. My house was quite small. I was the only one living there, and it was perfect for me. The yard was big and open, and there was a huge spot open on both sides of the porch that I knew I could make look really good. Little did I know that my green thumb dream would lead to a nightmarish encounter with a neighbor that I can only describe as an absolute nutcase. I will say that the day that I moved in, I had encountered a few neighbors that were great, and one neighbor that was a bit off. The first encounter I had with that neighbor, I was moving my boxes and furniture into my house, my brother helping, and it was around noon, and we were dutifully moving stuff in. She came over to the yard and just stood there watching us. After a few moments, I waved and went to introduce myself, and instead of shaking my hand, she asked if we were almost done, because we were making too much noise. At this point, I knew for a fact that she was going to be just another Karen that I'd seen on the internet. This may not seem important, but it helps to demonstrate who this neighbor was. Back to the house and the gardening, I decided that I wanted to plant some bushes in front of the windows on both sides of the porch, like I mentioned. I decided that they could add charm and character. After a bit of thinking on it, I opted to plant a beautiful mix of azaleas and hydrangeas, opting to mix the warm colors of the azaleas and the cools and white tones from the hydrangeas. These bushes were, in my opinion, eye-catching, and they would look gorgeous as they bloomed. Of course, what I thought would be gorgeous were a blight to my local Karen. One weekend, I had spent most of the morning planting the bushes and had gotten through about half of them, when Karen walked over to my yard and again just stood there staring at me. I noticed her, looked back and waved, and then went right back to it, assuming that not engaging would be enough to get rid of her. Of course, it wasn't, though. She walked right up into my yard and asked, Why are you planting those hideous bushes? I paused, looking at these cute little unassuming plants, thinking... How are they hideous? I mentioned that I liked them and that when they were grown and bloomed, they would have a ton of really pretty colors. She told me that they were ugly, and I asked her why she would judge them before she saw what they looked like when they were fully grown. She stared at me angrily for a few silent seconds and then said, You need to get rid of them. I laughed, like literally laughed at this suggestion. I asked her if she knew how much money I had spent on these bushes, sarcastically of course, and then went immediately back to pushing dirt around the bush. She scoffed at me, and then said, If you don't get rid of them, I'll get rid of them for you. I stopped, stood up, and looked her face to face. At this point, I was pretty upset and I was done dealing with this woman. I looked her square in the eyes and said, You know what? I'd like to see you try. Now, get off of my property before I call the police and have you trespassed. And I really don't want to do that my first week living here. Apparently, this was the worst thing that I could have said to her because try and, well, succeed, she did. It was about a week after the incident with the Karen in the front yard and would have been within the first three weeks of me living in the house. I was lying in bed completely passed out when I was tugged out of my slumber slightly by a beeping noise. I instinctively reached over to smack my alarm clock, but after hitting it probably a dozen times, I noticed that the beeping was not stopping. It was then that I realized it wasn't my alarm clock that was waking me up. It was my upstairs smoke alarm. 
as this clicked, the smell of burning wood crept its way into my nose, and it all came together. Panic set in as I stumbled out of bed, fumbling with my phone to call 911. Disoriented, confused, and slightly choking on the smoke, I ran out the back door just in time to see that the smoke was on the front of the house. I ran through the gate of the front yard, and sure enough, the front of my house was burning. As I was explaining this to the 911 operator that my house was on fire, I glanced over across the street and who should I see but Karen, sitting on her front porch and sipping on a cup of coffee while smiling and waving at me. My heart dropped when the realization hit me. She had deliberately set my house on fire, all because of a few bushes. Thankfully, the fire department arrived in time to put the fire out, and the damage wasn't as extensive as it could have been. But my sense of security was gone, replaced by this deep-rooted fear that someone so close to my home could harbor such malice over something as simple as not liking the bushes that I was planting. As I was standing there talking to the firefighters about the whole thing, I was approached by another neighbor, specifically the neighbor that lived directly next to me. He asked me if I was okay, and I told him that I was, and then explained that the damage wasn't too bad. And he followed that up with, I called the police to come out already, but I wanted to show you something. I was a bit confused at first, but why he approached me became very clear very quickly. He showed me his phone, and mentioned that he had a security camera that faced out the front window, and that it actually picked everything up. Right there, on his screen, I could clearly see Karen walking across the road with a gas can towards my house. You couldn't see her actually pouring the gas or starting the fire, but you could see her approach, and then could see the fire start lighting up the street, and see her running back towards her house and standing there watching it burn. The look on her face was horrifying, even in the slightly pixelated footage. You could tell that she was laughing, and see that she was actually clapping and jumping up and down as she celebrated her victory. She then ran back to her house, and came back out a few moments later with her coffee and just sat there, watching her handiwork. Thankfully, the footage was pretty clear, and she was wearing the same clothes as she was sitting on the porch. The cops arrived and asked a few questions, and we showed them the footage. The whole situation was pretty straightforward. She'd committed arson. When the police went over to talk to her about things, she tried to claim that she had been home all morning and that she had never left. And when she was questioned about why she smelled like gasoline, she literally told them that she liked the smell and that that wasn't a crime. They arrested her for what she had done, determining that there was enough evidence to actually take her in for arson. The repairs were costly and took a while, and I had to move back in with my mom for a bit until it was all done. I couldn't live in a house that was partially charred like that. Obviously, my bushes were lost to the flames, as they were the main target, but I took solace in knowing that Karen wasn't going to be a threat to myself or anyone else. When I was able to move back into the house, I did install a ring camera, and I actually went ahead and planted new bushes in the same spots. And now, when they bloom, I'm reminded of that image of seeing Karen cuffed and shoved into the back of a police car. Hi Raven, I wanted to share an event that happened to me and my granddaughter at the last place that I lived. My husband died in a car accident when my daughter was pregnant, so he never got to meet her, but also being an empty nester, I didn't feel right living in our big four-bedroom home alone. And I decided that it was time to downsize. I found a cute little condominium that was only about 20 minutes from my daughter and son-in-law, and it was a good price, so I moved right in. The only thing about it, however, 
was that it definitely needed a more homely and me touch to it. So, while I made some changes inside with the help of my kids, I also wanted to start up another garden like I had at my old home. My kids helped me put it together when they were younger, which made it all the more special to me. And now, my first granddaughter was at the age that they were, and I wanted to have her help with it. If she wanted to, of course. Maggie is like my little mini-me. I helped my daughter and son-in-law take care of her when she was born. I watched her a lot so they could sleep or even just to get out for a bit alone. And she loved staying over with me too. So when I brought up the garden, she was more than willing to help. And my daughter loved the idea. At the time of this event, I was 49 and my granddaughter was 8. She came over with some stuff that they had bought, including a small gardening kit, a sun hat, a mat, all the stuff that she needed. My son-in-law helped me with lining and digging the top part of the dirt since it was pretty hard, and then we went and did most of the rest. On the day that Maggie and I were out back deciding what we wanted to plant and where, my neighbor Howard had come out back and greeted us. The fences weren't very tall, it came up to about my chest, and seemed to more so just to be to separate the properties, rather than for privacy. But I didn't mind Howard. I think he was close to my age, maybe a year or two younger, but he seemed like a nice guy. He introduced himself when I moved in, and he even helped my son-in-law fix one of my windows. He stopped and asked what we were up to, and then we started talking about the garden for a bit. I noticed that he kept looking down at Maggie, and I realized that he hadn't met her yet, so I introduced them, explaining that she was my granddaughter. So we talked about her for a while, and then we continued on with our plans for the day. Now, Howard also has a small dog. I think he's a corgi, and there were a few kids in the neighborhood that liked to go over to his place to play with the dog, or I've even seen some kids walking the dog. So, he was definitely not unknown to the community, and he never gave off any weird feelings. In fact, the way he talked to me was very kind and playful in a way, and when he asked if I was single, I honestly thought that he may have even been flirting with me. It had been some time since my husband passed, so I didn't dislike the attention either. I started catching Howard outside on multiple occasions when Maggie and I were out there and we would start chatting for a while while we worked. The conversations were always friendly and innocent, and we all had a good time. Maggie even offered him some lemonade when we were taking a break. I didn't start to notice something was off until a little further into our gardening work. Howard was starting to show up every time we were out there, and it was fine at first, but he would start talking to Maggie, distracting her, which caused her to knock some things over before as well. There were also a few times where Maggie wasn't with me and I had gone out back to mow or de-weed, and he would show up again. The conversation at that point, though, would be brief. It was a quick, hey, how's it going? And then he would ask me about Maggie. And when I would mention that she wasn't with me, the conversation would pretty much end right there and he would leave. I started catching on to this and I wasn't really a fan of it. I felt bad because I started limiting how much Maggie would do. We didn't have much left, but we were planting the last of the seeds when he came over. And that's when I instructed Maggie to go inside and clean up. I could see his attention shift to her as she walked in, and our conversation became pretty dull, and he eventually walked off. This happened a few times, and I don't know if he caught on to what I was doing, or if he just gave up, but he started coming around less and less. There was one weekend that Maggie was going to be staying with me, and she was enjoying the sprinkler that I had set up to water the garden, so... I bought something similar to set up for her to play in. While she was changing into her swimsuit, I went out front to get the mail. On my way, 
I saw my neighbor across the way was out there, and we had begun talking about random things. At one point, I turned back to look at my condo when I saw Howard walking back from his driveway and into his house. My first thought was, great, he's going to ruin something that I had planned for Maggie. I knew that she was still inside waiting for me though, so I finished my conversation with my neighbor and then started walking back towards my door. I don't know what it was or how to explain it, but I felt the need to walk over towards Howard's side and to see if he was outside. While we had the wall-like fences out back, they went as far as the condo. The front of them either had a small half-bricked wall or nothing separating them, so I could easily walk over on his side of the property. I could hear him laughing, so I knew that he was out back. This immediately made me feel uncomfortable, because I had a feeling that Maggie was probably already out back as well. Even though I told her to wait for me, the kids are still kids, and she was excited. So, even though I shouldn't have, I went to open his gate, and, to my disgust, I saw him standing at the fence, looking into my yard, with his pants down. I immediately yelled at him, none of which were nice words or words that Maggie probably should have ever heard me say, but it was enough to make him stumble and trip as he tried to pick his pants up and go inside. I immediately ran into my home to find Maggie out back, looking around confused. I asked her what she was doing and she explained that she was trying to bring the sprinkler outside for me to help when Howard showed up. While she was grabbing the hose, he told her how to hold it up in the air to make it look like it was raining, to which she did. I was disgusted and was trying to keep calm in front of Maggie, but she could already tell that something was wrong by the way that she was talking to me. Unfortunately, I had to lie to her and tell her that we just couldn't play in the sprinkler because it was going to storm, and instead suggested that we make homemade popsicles inside, which seemed to cheer her up. While she was getting started, I called the police in the leasing office to tell them what I had just witnessed. The police came over and took down the information, however they said they couldn't do much since he was on his own property and I had opened the gate, but they said that if it happened again and anyone else witnessed it, to call them back so they could try to get him for indecent exposure. The leasing office apologized and said that they would talk to him, but they said they couldn't keep him from being in his backyard. It was like they missed the entire point. He was invading my space by looking over and doing what he was doing. So, I asked them if I could put up a taller privacy fence, and they refused. They said that it had to stay uniform, and that there would be too many steps to try and get the people or businesses that actually owned the place to pay for the changes. They told me that they weren't even willing to try. I had just moved into this place a few months ago, and now no longer felt safe there. Or, at least, I didn't feel safe having my granddaughter there. I told my daughter and my son-in-law about the incidents, too. They were torn. None of us wanted this guy anywhere near Maggie. It broke my heart, and I know that Maggie was upset about it, but when she came over, she wasn't allowed to go out back and she could only go out front if someone was with her. I didn't even like her staying the night, so if anything, I stayed the night with them when they needed a babysitter. Howard didn't even try to show his face around after that, and it wasn't even just around me. People saw the cops at my house that day, and I wasn't going to keep that information to myself. I told anyone and everyone. And, just from word of mouth, he was shunned pretty hard. The other kids were not allowed to be around him, and when he went out front, you could see other parents or grandparents pulling their kids to the other side of them. It must have eventually gotten to him, because within that same year, he moved out. I saw the moving trucks, and I couldn't have been more relieved. Once he was gone, I let Maggie stay the night have friends over, and even play out back and enjoy the hard work that she put into that garden. 
I lived there for a few years, but over time, I learned the leasing people were not as nice as they appeared to be when I moved in, and they weren't giving me any reason to make me reconsider. But now, I live in a small house with my own yard and a big privacy fence, and I will never let something like that happen again. Because next time, Grandma might have to use something other than her words. This was something that I witnessed a few years back while working at a landscaping company. We received an order or job to almost completely redo someone's front yard. It was kind of sloped, so he wanted it to be leveled out. He wanted a rock bed around the house and a garden of some sort surrounding a tree in his yard that is bricked off, as well as a couple of other small details here and there. I was actually assigned to go out to the property with one of our leads to get an idea of what he wanted, to plan it out and make sure that it was achievable. I remember the guy being very polite at the time. He explained things well, like he had some experience in landscaping too, judging by some of the verbiage that he used. Once we got it all plotted, we showed him the details of the, basically the blueprint of his yard, and our plans, asking if it was good. And this is a good time to correct anything that he felt was wrong, not quite what he wanted, etc. However, he said it all looked good and thanked us for our time. We scheduled the actual job, and we were out there about a week later. There was a decent sized group of guys out there, including myself and the manager, or lead, and that was with me when we did the draft. We were all updated as to what to expect and what the job was, not to mention the lead was always there to direct us with what we had to do, so we definitely were not going into it blind. As we started the work, we did some basic outlines and still tried to involve the owner to have him check off the work along the way. He greeted us when we got there and began, but then was in his home for the most part, which was fine. Most of the time, if they were home, they stayed inside, but occasionally looked out the window or came out to see how it was going. He did not. He only came out if we requested him to. So, when we did, he would check off the outlines and say that it all looked good, so we would continue the work. The yard wasn't huge, so we were able to get most of it complete in a single day other than a few things to top off the yard the next day. As we were picking up our supplies and equipment, the customer, let's call him Rich, came out of his house as the lead requested to check the work and get his thoughts. He looked... pissed. He walked around the side of his house, picked up a rock, and threw it back down. He walked over to the flower bed and ripped up one of the flowers. He then proceeded to yell at us about how it was all wrong. He said we got the wrong rocks. The flowers were supposed to be a very specific color, like he wanted bright red tulips and we had gotten him red-orange. He even claimed that he could tell by standing on the ground that it was still at an angle. We dug a line as to where to level it and had him check it off and he agreed that it was good. However, the customer is always right, so and we apologized and told him that we would get it all corrected tomorrow. We even had him write down the very specific rocks that he wanted so we knew to bring the correct ones. Later that day, we had a quick meeting with the owner of the landscape company that turned into a bit of a lecture. He talked about how he was disappointed in us due to the job that day, and that Rich had called him personally to complain. That's when he shared with us that Rich was a good friend of his and that this friend had a lot of money. And that's why it was so important to get this job right tomorrow. Because if we didn't, then we would all be reprimanded or potentially fired. A little annoyed that this guy was getting special treatment, we all just agreed to do better the next day and headed home. So now the same team of us are out there the next day, redoing and completing the work. 
We clarified with him when we started that we had the right rocks. He agreed. We confirmed the flowers were the right color. He agreed. We got it almost all the way done when Rich came outside, looked at the flower bed, and immediately complained that it was wrong. Our lead questioned him about it because he said the flowers were good, to which he snapped back, saying that it was the shape. He was angry because the garden was supposed to be in a bricked circle, but he claimed that the circle was more oval and lopsided. There was one very small part that went out a little further than the rest because of a raised tree root. He said that it looked trashy and half-assed. So, our lead again apologized and explained how we could correct it, and he finally agreed. Rich went back in, and while a few people finished up the rock bed and picking up, I helped our lead and a couple other guys on the bed. It was probably only about 20 minutes or so, we had leveled out the area with the root, causing us to also raise the bed a little when Rich came back outside, but he looked much calmer this time. He wasn't smiling and he didn't look happy, but he at least didn't look like he was going to scream at any moment. He started walking down into the yard when he asked, Who's in charge of this job? Our lead, Ed, raised his hand and started walking out from the other side of the tree. He started explaining, saying that he was in charge in a completely friendly manner, apologizing for all the issues, but was then quickly cut off when Rich pulled out a gun and shot Ed. I know it's cliche to say, but it seriously happened so fast. I was still standing by the tree, but was watching at the time. He pulled his arm up, aimed right at Ed, and pulled the trigger. Ed fell backwards on the ground, and I immediately ducked. After a few seconds of no follow-up firing, I looked up to see Rich calmly walking back into his house. I shouted for Ed and quickly ran over to him to see if he was still alive. He was, thankfully, but there was a lot of blood. I was terrified, worried that he could have hit something major, but I at least knew that he didn't hit his heart as the guy shot him around his right shoulder. I was also worried that he could come back out and start firing on the rest of us, so I told them all to leave as quickly as they could, leaving anything that we still had out. One of the other guys called 911 as I held a shirt, a towel, and whatever else we had on us on the wound. EMTs and the cops showed up pretty quickly, and to my surprise, the guy still had not come back out. Not even with the police in his driveway. They took Ed to the hospital, but I stayed behind to explain every last damn detail on what happened to him. Two other guys were there and explained what they saw, too. They then approached the house with their hands on their guns as well, knocking on the door. I felt like I was holding my breath as I watched them enter. I tried to remain calm, but seeing how unaffected Rich was as he walked out the door with the cops infuriated me. I yelled something at him, and one of the officers told me that I could go ahead and leave and that they would contact me if they needed anything. I immediately went to the hospital to see about Ed's condition, and hopefully to be able to keep his wife calm, as I'm sure that she was probably told by now. As for the update, Ed did live. It messed up his shoulder pretty bad, and being that he's right-handed, he definitely has difficulties doing things like he used to, but he doesn't let it bother him. He retired early, and is having a great life now. I've never seen a more optimistic man. Rich was cooperative with authorities, admitted that he shot him because he was upset with how we kept getting the work wrong, and was ultimately charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And, of course... The owner was mad at us for messing stuff up, and while we weren't fired at the time, a few of the guys there that day were conveniently fired for other reasons shortly after. I, as well as Ed and a few others, also decided to walk out on the bastard, since he didn't back any of us up. He could have pressed charges on him for doing this to us, but he didn't, and instead blamed us. Screw that. I know that this is one of those freak experiences that I would hope no one else has ever gone through, but I didn't like the thought of it happening again, 
so I didn't do any more landscaping jobs. Unless it was my own stuff or for family. It's still something that always sticks to me, though. And I wonder when I see someone get irrationally angry, if they could do something so extreme. So, there's my story, and I hope that Rich lives a very lonely rest of his life, so that he doesn't do this to anyone else, and most importantly, I hope that we never meet again. So, my friends, that was a collection of gardening or landscaping stories, however you want to look at it. I went with gardening because, I don't know, it just kind of sounded cooler. Gardening versus landscaping, I don't know. Landscaping would have worked too. Anyways, good stories working with plants, the yards, stuff like that. That first story was definitely a doozy. The last story was definitely a doozy, and the two in between were definitely doozies. That would say all four of them are doozies. We have a 100% doozy collection here. We are a f four to zero doozies in this collection. Anyways, um, good stuff. Good, good stuff. Good stories. And I want to say thank you to everyone who submitted their stories to me, or those who let me use their stories from places on the internet, such as Reddit. Y'all are amazing, and I do very much appreciate it. And of course, I appreciate you. You, the person listening. Yes, you. I know you heard that and you're like, wait, me? Yes, you. I appreciate you. Thank you. If you enjoyed this collection, please do hit that thumbs up button. If you're new to the channel and liked what you heard, please consider subscribing as it does help tremendously. You can also leave me a comment letting me know down below what your favorite flower is, if you have one. Have you ever had a garden or a flower bed that you maintained? What'd you think of it? I have. I enjoy it. I have a small flower bed out front that is mostly taken over by English ivy that I planted. But there's some other things that grow in there, and they're pretty nice. One year out back, we even had a, a small sunflower field that we created in our backyard. That was crazy. Because a lot of them grew. And a lot of them bloomed. <laughs> uh, would love to do that again someday. Maybe. We'll see. Anyways, uh, there's other things you can do, such as joining or Patreon, where you can get early access to content like this, so long as I get it up early. You can also do a super thanks, which is a tip to the channel. Never expected, always appreciated, though. And I think that's it. I don't think there's anything else I need to mention, so... Yeah. Thank you so very much for listening to this point, and I hope you're having a beautiful weekend. I do hope that I see you again very soon, but until then, remember you are loved, you are valid... You are important. You're the best you that you can be. Never let anyone tell you otherwise. And until I see you again, my friends, much love and sleep well.